Coming to you from the top of Timbaclume Supper Club in Asbury Park, New Jersey, welcome to the Timbaclume Radio Show, where each week we bring you interesting, creative, and dynamic people from the world of entertainment, sports, business, food, and philanthropy. Today we have special guest news director and host of the first morning news at WOR, 710 AM, Joe Bartlett. We have the head football coach from Monmouth University, Kevin Callahan, and musical guest tonight is Mark Ribbler. I'm Paul Diamidi, and here's your host, Tim McLeod. And that is Mark Ribbler on guitar. We're going to be uh, hearing from Mark over the course of the show and have a little conversation with him later. But thanks so much for being here in Asbury Park. Uh, we had a big conversation about how we were going to open the show tonight. Um, nobody in show business, I mean, you know, I've been in some version of show business since I was the captain of the pinafore in seventh grade all my life. Um, but, and no one wants really to, to listen to shows that are, you know, down or depressing or something, but, but I have to acknowledge something here this evening with all of you uh, in our studio audience here and also at home. Um, we did a show a couple months ago with my son. Uh, my son Jack, who when he was nine years old was uh, diagnosed with uh, leukemia. And we had some wonderful doctors here. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that happens, as you know, anyone listening to who's had that touch their family, um, is you meet other families, you meet other people, you meet inspirational people. And uh, I was warned by my brother not to do this uh, today <laughs> because he said you're never going to make it through. But some people are just really special on this planet. You know, we lost one of them uh, a couple of days ago. Her name was Maya, and uh, you know, I'm going to read something that her mother wrote and. Uh, as I said, I, I apologize for the, you know, the seriousness of this to start out a, what is usually a fun, a fun show. But Maya was born in August of 2002 and she embraced life immediately. She seemed to walk and talk just faster than any of her peers. She grabbed life and ran, always looking for new experiences and new friends. And she grew to enjoy soccer immensely and she loved school. And then late in October of 2007, Maya, who was then five years old, she was a kindergarten student, was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, T-cell stage three. All bad words, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, she was hospitalized and commenced a, a two-year intensive chemothera uh, chemotherapy protocol of treatment. And uh, I won't read all the rest of it to you, but the truth of it is that what happened was, after Maya, Maya relapsed any number of times. And then, because of her treatment, she actually developed leukemia and it required a stem cell transplant, and she was here being treated wonderfully by the people who visited with us on right. the show from the Valerie Center. And, and if you ever hear about the Valerie Center, you ought to be really generous to them. But then she ended up going to CHOP in Philly, and they really felt they had nothing more for her. Her family and she just didn't want to quit, and so they went to St. Jude's, where she's basically lived for a long period of time. She, she lost her life a couple of days ago at the age of 10. And my real reason for mentioning this is not only what a wonderful child she was and really an inspiration to all of us, but also I saw this sort of throwaway line in the paper yesterday and then I heard it again on the news. And it's all about, you know, with, with all the gun issues that are going on right now, it said, do you know that twice as many children are killed each year by a gun as by pediatric cancer? And I'm listening to someone, well, there's a couple of bundles of good news for you. Um, I'm just disappointed that, as a country, that we can't find the resolve and the money to take on these cancers head on. And they're, they're so close in a lot of ways, you know, because we have a, you know, a child who's in remission in our family, we hear, and of course our ears perk up anytime anybody mentions pediatric cancer. But they're close in a lot of ways, and the fights over money and the sequester and all the rest of it and funding being cut is just insane. And, you know, I just hope that for people listening out there, just ask yourself, when you were in school, did you ever have a child in your class who had cancer? Now, I'm an old person, so that goes way back to the 50s and 60s, but no, I didn't know any children that had cancer. Maya has had a girl in her class who also has leukemia. They're in the same classroom. And if any of us think that the air we breathe and the water we drink and the food we eat isn't contributing to this, I think they're just not paying attention. But, uh, that's uh, a way to, to open a show, but, but Sweet Maya uh, deserved the mention. So, on another topic here, we talk each week about uh, grammar things, and I have a couple of friends in the audience tonight. So tonight's grammar question is, there is, if a word is spelled the same but has an opposite meaning, 
what is that called? And it's not an antonym, that's just, it's an opposite. An opposite if it's the same, It's the same word can be used in opposite ways. And it's spelled the same. Our audience there is you, saying No, it's homonym? not a homonym, and now you're answering, and now you have to leave the room. <laughs> you're, gonna be, you're gonna be held back for a year for that. No, that's what you would think, homonym, antonym, one of those. Well, actually, it's called a contronym, or an auto-antonym. But the example that we were using just yesterday, because it came up, is the word resign. You can actually resign from your job, or you can resign with your job, and it's spelled the same. Or buckle. You can buckle something, so it's really tightly done, or your knees can buckle. Where it I'm not as crazy about the buckle one, is that what? <laughs> and we commencement. Can... Uh, the per the uh, head of Monmouth University is here with us this evening, Paul, the esteemed Paul Gaffney. All right. And he will be um, to officiating his final commencement. But commencement is when you begin, but when you're in college, it's when you win. Right. And I think he has a lot of explaining to do about that. <laughs> but, it, <laughs> but anyway, thank you all for being here tonight in uh, Asbury Park. It's our pleasure to be here with you. Broadcasting from Tim McCoon's Supper Club in Asbury Park, New Jersey. Listen to us every Saturday at 5 p.m. on WR 710 a.m. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Tim McLoon Radio. And listen to this show as well as past shows on our website, TimMcLoonRadioShow.com. You're listening to the Tim McLoon Radio Show. Next up, news director and host of the First Morning News at WOR 710, Joe Bartlett. We'll be right back after this. Do people say to you, uh, you don't look like Joe Bartlett? Yeah, they no. only hear you on the radio. They ever say, oh, you don't look like you're supposed to look. They always think I should be fatter. <laughs> really? Yeah. I'm working on that. I'm working, working on, working on it. it. When you're here in a restaurant. Yeah. What I really liked about your bio, though, is that you get right to it. These are the, <laughs> these are the first seven words in his bio. Name best newscaster in New York City. So uh, there. Why bore us with the other stuff? You know? <laughs> yeah, where he grew up. With it. And then I, I love this one too. The first morning news, a one hour news update to start the day at 5 a.m. Are, are you like going to bed now? Like as soon as the show's done? I, pretty soon, yeah. No, I get up at 2.30 in the morning. Do you really? Yeah. Wow. 2.30 in the morning, I get in between 3.30 and 4 to be prepared for that. Every day. But how did you do that? I mean, you know what? Um, what time do you go to sleep? I don't go to sleep as early as I should. Maybe nine, you know, nine o'clock. Sometimes up a little earlier. So you're five, 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 five to six. But the, the payoff is I get out early. Yeah. I'm done. Everybody else is still. And then you go back from lunch. Uh, I, I, uh, well, when are you, when are you playing golf? day? When are you done? About one o'clock. Really? Yeah. Are you serious? You do go golfing? I do. Oh, there. You. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we've got the whole career arc. Not so bad. <laughs> right? <laughs> Okay, so where'd you start, though? How did it all begin? I what started, did you think you were going to do radio? Where'd you grow up? I, I grew up in upstate New York. Um, my major in college was computer programming, but I thought that was too boring. But this was in the 1970s when computers were rooms. Um, I got excited about radio. I started a little radio station in Saratoga Springs, WKAJ. And um, I was just doing... There we go. Saratoga Springs. Springs. There we go. Those are the two people that still live there. <laughs> Saratoga is a beautiful no, town. That's great, especially yeah. if you love horse racing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a very lively town in August. Um, so that's why I started. I started, the, the guy offered me a job doing news. I never really had taken any... Well, I took some journalism courses, but yeah. um, it just sort of took me where I am today. It was, it was fun, uh, it was exciting, everything was new. You got to, uh, to be at the scene of the action. So that's what drew me into it. So did you know? I mean, when it's, it's almost when people say, how do you know when you should marry someone? Right. You'll just know. But when, when you got into radio, did you, this is where I should be? I mean, were you thinking, well, maybe TV, maybe where? Well, look, and I probably could have made a little more money doing computer programming. Look at you know, guys like Nick <laughs> Gates and everything. But um, uh, no, this, this was, you want to be able to be excited about what you're going to do when you get up in the morning. 
and when you get up at 2.30 in the morning, you better be very excited about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I, every day I look forward to going to work because every day is a new challenge, every day is new. You never know what's going to happen during the day. Never. Well, living around here, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. We, we had Howie Rose, the uh, Mets baseball announcer yeah. on, and what was interesting about his career was actually he always worked in New York, which goes against the, the uh, stereotype of you got to go out of town. So, I mean, did you have a lot of stops along the way? Or? I, did, I had a couple. I've got one in Saratoga, and I worked at a couple of radio stations in Albany, New York. Um, interestingly enough, I was working at a radio station that was purchased by John A. Gamblin. So that I helped me. That, yeah, that helped me with my connection to WOR. Really? Yeah. So, what was your first gig with OR? I was a street reporter. Uh, actually, prior to that, prior to being hired, I did a week covering the Statue of Liberty Centennial, sort of as like an on-air tryout. Yeah. <laughs> it just sounds <laughs> funny. I don't know why. It's <laughs> not a week. Well, it was, it was a week-long event. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, I was a street reporter, and within eight months, because of the turnover, I was the acting news director. Really? Yeah. Wow. What year was that? It was 1987. How do you seem younger? Yeah. <laughs> I've been there a long time. I mean, I, I've been very, very fortunate. And WOR is a wonderful place to work. It's a great radio station, as you know. Well, were you always confident in, because I have to tell you, you have one of the smoothest voices. And you also sounded like you belonged on that show. And I don't even know necessarily how I'm coming up to this. <laughs> but your voice matched their voices. It just looked like it was the right fit. But were you always confident with actually just the pure sound of your voice? Or no, no. That no. Did you listen to yourself? Yeah, it's awful. I mean, I, 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 really, that's how we all feel. <laughs> really, I, I, don't, I get a little nervous listening to it myself. Because it's interesting, because with us, you know, this is a new venture for us, and we're, you know, trying to find our way with the uh, dreaded Tim McLuhan radio show. And I've been really reluctant to hear myself, and yet I know I should to, you know, hear how old well, mistakes I make. But uh, I'm just funny about it. it if it comes, I mean, you do what comes naturally, you know, and, and you don't. Um, my um, yardstick is I just try to be honest and natural because the listeners can pick up phoniness real fast. Yeah. You know, you, you, so the best thing to do is just be yourself. And so this is who I am, this is my voice, and uh, so far it's been okay. Well, I'm starting to dislike it as the show goes on. <laughs> but up until then, I thought it was very mellifluous, so I just felt like using that word. I have no idea what it really means. The, uh, but have you seen a lot of changes in, in broadcasting? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, it's time because now you've been there, so 20. 26 years, yeah, yeah, it's almost 27, yeah. I, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, internet, obviously. Yeah. It was just a frightening story this week that talked about 30% of people get their news in the morning on Facebook. I'm I don't think there was a married to one of them. Really? <laughs> right. You know, my wife and I used to have a joke about stuff. She, she would say to me, literally, you know, I learn something interesting from you almost every day. Because I'm a newspaper reader and I've got yeah. the TV on in the background and I don't really have a job. And so I've got time to accumulate information. <laughs> every last thing I tell her now, she's already heard. She's really? already heard it. From Facebook and Twitter? Mostly Facebook and, not Twitter, mostly Facebook. She's already got it. I mean, just think That's about scary. how newspapers are struggling now because basically I wake up in the morning and I'll read the Asbury Park Press and I'll read the Star Ledger and then there's usually a weekly or something in there and I'll read the Times on the weekends. I'm an anachronism doing that because she's already just, oh no, that happened three days ago. Well, in, in terms of the New York Times, I get it delivered on the weekends. Yeah, on the same day. But I, I read it on my iPad. I don't go out to the driveway. <clears throat> I just go out at the end of the day, pick it up, and throw it away. I read it on the iPad. I'm doing the Sopranos opening still. Every day. I'm walking out. I'm still <laughs> out at the driveway. <laughs> you like getting that? the paper, right? Yeah. Like wondering if the neighbors are looking at me. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I don't think there's much question about. It, but it's just the immediacy of the information. It's just. And the other thing is, the newspaper turns it around, it's going to be another 24 hours. And you also, in right, newspapers, I mean, they're just sort of a, a recapitulation of what you probably already know. Yeah. Bloggers, and I think that's going to even become more widespread. People are, every, everybody out there now is a reporter. But the thing that bothers me is the level of misinformation. Well, that's true. And, you, you know, there was probably a time when there was literally probably there was, when an editor would call some copywriter or some young writer into the office and say, what the heck are you writing? This is, this is totally untrue, or you better research better, take it back, bring it back to me in half an hour when you've written. 
That's not going on anymore. No, no. If you were a reporter, you recover a story, you kind of go to it there, you collect all the facts, sort it out, put it together, you may have to submit it to an editor. Now, it, as the story develops, it's being fed to Twitter, Facebook, all social media, and it's sorted out that way. So what you get initially may not be the fact. I mean, every single story lately has developed into something different after being exposed on Facebook or Twitter. The thing that's interesting to me is I actually, I think I went over to the dark side literally yesterday because my, you know, we've been talking on these airwaves about my struggles with my phone and <laughs> all the people I've been hanging up on and I don't know how to hold a call to get another one and then I'm talking to somebody in Nebraska, I have no <laughs> idea why. And uh, yesterday, I actually looked at the Mets final box score on my phone. Wow. And the box score was the thing the next morning, you know, and, you, and of course if they were playing in San Diego or something, you'd see that box score three days later. But the, uh, maybe, but I was just... But you can get live, you can watch it live. Yeah, on, I was on, reading on the, the game one. Yeah, I don't know. And then people watching movies on their phones, are they kidding me? I don't think so. And, uh, well, anyway, Joe Bartlett, it's such a pleasure to have you, but, but we've got an even more serious reason to speak with you, and something kind of funny is going to happen here in a little while, so stay tuned to us. For those of you who just joined us, you're listening to the Timapoon Radio Show from Timapoon Supper Club in Asbury Park, New Jersey. We will be right back after this. Show.com. The show is free to attend. We offer a full menu and a bar and a great wine list. So come on out and be a part of the show. All the members of the show uh, will receive a gift. Tonight we're giving out Tim McClue coffee mugs and t-shirts, I think. So for reservations, give us a call at 732-774-1155 or simply go to TimMcClueRadioShow.com. And now, here's your host, Tim McClue. Yeah. So we're back here with WOR's own Joe Bartlett. And Joe, um, you know, at our opening of the uh, show, for those who didn't hear, uh, a dear friend of ours, uh, little Maya, passed away of uh, leukemia at the age of 10 uh, just a couple of days ago. And uh, I, I mentioned that on the air, but that's one of the reasons you're here tonight. So tell us about the uh, organization you were. St. Baldrick's was formed by three guys uh, about 13 years ago. These were very fortunate guys making a lot of money doing reinsurance. They, they said, we've got to give back. We've been fortunate. So they said, let's raise some money for childhood cancer. And they picked one of the guys and said, we'd like to shave his head, see if we can raise $17,000. We're going to meet at Jim Brady's Pub in Lower Manhattan on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, to raise $17,000. They raised over $100,000 for his time. Last year, we raised $33 million shaving heads. <laughs> This year you raised $8 trillion and solved the federal deficit. <laughs> uh, speaking of the federal government, St. Baldrick's is the largest private contributor to childhood uh, cancer research other than the federal government. Uh, but uh, in total, over the years, we have contributed about $170 million for pediatric cancer research. Really? And, um, $170 million. And very exciting because this year, St. Baldrick's partnered with Stand Up to Cancer and we are funding a dream team of researchers, the best researchers in pediatric cancer. We're funding them for three years, $14.5 million, uh, jointly between Stand Up and St. Baldrick's, to work on cutting edge research to save people like Maya. We wanna, we wanna cure childhood cancer, and we're gonna get there. This is fantastic research they're gonna do. It's genomics and immunotherapy. This is the cutting edge stuff and we are putting out a lot of money on the line to get a breakthrough here so we can save lives. Well, on behalf of my son, Jack, I'm just saying one thing. Hurry up, would you please? <laughs> <laughs> so, Joe, I specialize in asking stupid questions. Was there actually a St. Baldrick? Or no, 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 it's a good question. I'm just no, 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 no. A lot of people ask that. I mean, they're, they're looking through well, the Bible I for St. Baldrick. A lot of people ask that. I'm withdrawing my question. No, no, it was a combination of St. Patrick's Day and Bald. Oh, well, there Saint you go. Baldrick's. So who do we have standing behind you here since we're on the radio? This is our barber. His name is Vinny Cantrella. Vinny, thanks for coming out and doing this for us. Vinny. You know, you have to have a barber named Vinny. If it's not Sal, it's going to be Vinny. <laughs> so are you still charging like 250 for these haircuts or what? A little bit more, yeah. We're up around 
Twelve dollars. Oh, come on. All right. You know, I, I used to go to a, I used to go to a barber who was blind when I was a kid. I had, it kind of looks like it actually. So was mine apparently. <laughs> Mine was just vindictive. Yeah, there's a difference. <laughs> All right, let him go. Vinny, are you ready to go? I'm ready. So for okay, those of you at home, go ahead. Joe has a cape on, and he's got uh, he's ready to start getting snipped. And here we go. So he is going to have his head entirely shaved. And for those of you who are uh, you know aware, obviously, of the effects of. Uh, Chemotherapy and the like, and unfortunately, a lot of children, of course, adults too, lose all their hair. I'll tell you about um, these shavings at St. Baldwin's events. You know, there are some of the children who are going through the chemotherapy, and they've lost their hair, and they keep their hats on. However, the more people that shave, the more comfortable those children are in taking off their hats. You know, my son never, Amazing sight. never wore a hat. Never, he didn't care. He, he did if he was cold. Uh, uh, by the way, you have one ugly. Yeah, <laughs> What we're seeing now, Vinny is like, Vinny, Man, Vinny does like 40 second haircuts. Oh, oh, it doesn't hurt, right? You're okay so no, far? I know, he, he's, he's, he's great. Very Joe, good. tell us about the last time you had the, the Clippers. Uh, yeah, the last time I did this, this is interesting. I cheaped out. I went to the store and I bought my own razor. Now, you're, oh. supposed, to, you're supposed to have a professional barber do this, like Vinny. But we did it on I'm the not air. sure if Vinny's a professional. We yeah, saw him on the board. Certainly <laughs> <not>. <laughs> Donna Hanover and my wife did this. And uh, the, as Vinny will attest, these things have to be oiled. Ours, that one was not oiled, and it was like pulling it. And I pulled out my hair. <laughs> I think that's what happened to mine. <laughs> I should have oiled my head more. Well, we're almost three quarters of the oh, way through. He's, he's, on the, he's on the back stretch. Yeah, actually, you have a very nice head. I take it back. It's kind of, my dad had some chrome dome. I'm I don't know if I'm going to keep it this way. My uh, wife didn't want to have children with us. But the, uh, <laughs> look at this. Well, he's he looks very, very nice. And, and Joe, so how do people find St. Baldrick's and how do they donate? StBaldrick's.org is their website. You just put my name up and there's a big box that says donate. We'd appreciate it. Uh, we also have a link from our website, WOR710.com. And um, even though I've done this shaving, you can continue to contribute. I would appreciate it. You know, I think if you did something about the facial hair too while you're there, Vinny. <laughs> <laughs> a little work on the eyebrows. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, you get an entire makeover here, Joe. <laughs> We're here with Joe Bartlett, WOR's Joan Bartlett, who's having his head shaved, totally bald right now. The facial hair is a little weak, isn't it, Tim? What's that? The facial hair is a little weak. No, I think it looks pretty good. I, I, I am such a, a hair challenge person. I couldn't even grow a beard. I had like a little, I had bald spots in my beard. It was pathetic. You look pretty damn good, Joe. Wow, man. Man. I brought a hat just in case. Well, <laughs> we were going to give you one. <laughs> so your, your wife is here, and she's like rethinking the whole deal. Oh, uh, yeah. Now I look like my father, this guy. Uh, What's that? Yeah, I look she's, like my father. That's what she said. I'm not sure she was ready to, to think about it. That's a little creepy. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Tim, I really appreciate you doing this. And, you know, um, I, and I know you personally can appreciate the battle that's going on out there. And we are really making some headway. You know, we were able to save 70 That's a bad pun, but go right ahead. 70 percent, close to almost 80 percent of uh, children who come down with child cancer can be cured. Yeah. Can be cured. The problem is, though, as you most likely know, um, there are some long-term effects. Absolutely. Well, it's the, re it's the relapse issue. Relapse issue also. My son has it. And, but he's already had, you know, this, he had cranial uh, radiation. He had three and a half years of chemotherapy. That's pretty severe. Three and a half years. And, and one of the things we're trying to do is to mitigate those long-term effects, try and find better ways to do that treatment so that they just don't have to blast these young kids with chemotherapy. Well, all their, for people that aren't familiar with leukemia, the, it's, a, it's a blood cancer, and our blood has three parts, white cells, red cells, and platelets. And so what they do is the leukemic cells are in the white cells, and well, they're also the ones, that, sadly, that help us against infection. So they just beat the heck out of all the white cells. They get rid of all of them, generations and gener over the course of years. And so these kids are so susceptible to a cold that can be tragic, and also many other diseases that we actually carry around in our bodies all the time, but don't activate. Vinny's doing a beautiful he is job right with you. He's <laughs> happy. Do you have talcum? Do you have any talcum? <laughs> he's got the talcum. Now he's got the hair down his neck. I don't know. But anyway, Joe, we can't thank you. Uh, you know. <laughs> As, as parents of a child who's gone through this, but for all the parents out there and people who don't even know yet that this is coming their way, the amount of money you've raised is a wonderful thing. Joe Bartlett, WR you. Radio. Thank you. Thank you. Representing the St. Baldrick's Foundation.
going to take a quick break. You're listening to the Tim Boom Radio Show from Tim Boom Supper Club in Asbury Park. Joe, thank you very much. Vinny Cantrell, and thank you for shaving his head. We'll be right back after this. Joe, 